This is Steve Zeltzer with Workweek, and I'm speaking with Mawata Kamara. She is a nurse, a chief union rep at San Leandro Hospital with CNA National Nurses Union. Welcome to Workweek. Thank you for having me. We start with what's been happening uh, at San Leandro Hospital and, and what the conditions you uh, and the other nurses face and the patients face as a result of those conditions. Okay, I would try to be as chronological as I possibly can. Um, I, as a chief nurse rep and um, just a member of CNA, I am also on the bargaining team. So two years ago, we went into bargaining. Um, our contract, our last contract ended and we needed to bargain for a new contract with AHS. Um, this came at a very important time because prior to Right before we started bargaining, AHS went to layoffs at the hospital. Um, it was around October prior to going into bargaining. They stated that they had low census and they needed to lay people off. And um, that was the Alameda Health Service. Alameda Health Service. I'm sorry. I don't I'm keep seeing AHS. I'm not sure if yeah. everybody's familiar. But they lay off um, quite a few nurses. Um, I was actually one of those nurses that were laid off, laid off, and I was working in med service at the time, and they decided that they were gonna t take, uh, I think there were about 15 nurses that were laid off in the med service unit, and um, basically defi their definition is laid off, laying off was this. You work 40 hours a week, we're going to take away your benefits, and tell you, say you're no longer full time and make you um, per diem, what we call per diem in healthcare, mean as needed, have you on schedule as needed. But the trick was they were still having us work 40 hours a week, but without our benefits. So they still needed a staff. They lied and said that we were having low census. We were just going into flu season. Um, they just took away our benefits and had us working 40 hours a week. So, um, Again, this was a started. This started a whole cas a cascading event because a lot of nurses, of course, left. Because um, why would someone want to work forty hours a week without benefits? A lot of nurses have families. So again, this was the beginning of a lot of troubles we started to see because it's right before flu season. Nurses are leaving, but our patients' population is still coming in. We have a lot of old people in our communities. We have a lot of just people with chronic illness, illnesses that are, you know, um, that get particularly sick during the winter time. So we're starting to have influx of patients, short staff. We started this chronic issues with being short staff all the time. Started since two years ago, um, you know, and it's going on till to this day. Um, we're always shorter nurse or two, which means that the nurses that are there are overworked. And when people are overworked, they make more mistakes. You know, especially being in an emergency room, um, we have patients waiting in the emergency room for too long. They get sick and tired of waiting. Um, and then they end up leaving without their needs being met. So with that layoffs, the issue with the layoffs, um, we went to a period of time where people were just leaving the emergency room and are, are left without being seen is what we call the terminology. The rates were just going sky high, which means that all of the members of our communities were coming into the emergency room. The, whatever issues that they were having, they would wait for four or five hours, get sick and tired of leaving and just leave. And our only excuse was, I'm sorry, we don't have enough staff. So, Again, we started this, you know, going to administration, telling them we're chronically short staff. This is going to be a problem. Before they even lay off nurses, we told them, if you have good nurses working full time in your facility and you cut their benefits, they're going to leave. You know, there are other hospitals out there. A lot of these nurses have experience. Why wouldn't they want to go somewhere else? So that was one of the many issues that we had. So we went into bargaining with this mindset that, okay, we know what we're going to fight for. And, you know, we just want to make sure that this hospital understands like the needs of our community and our nurses. Um, the first challenge we met was the head of bargaining for AHS, Alameda Health System. They did not come there to bargain. They came there to, they came there to union bus. 
I'm just gonna you know say it as it is. They were very disrespectful at the table. They felt like they didn't need to listen to us. Um, I think traditionally in bargaining, um, we'll have nurses come and tell you know the administration side some of the conditions that we're facing. So you know, sort staffing we're talking about, and you know, according to the head of the bargaining for Alameda system. Our stories were just hyperboles. We were just exaggerating what's going on without not really understanding what nurses were going on is with the short staffing, chronically being short staffed and what it was doing and the stress it was putting on the nurses in our community. Um, our entire contracts, all of the articles in our contract were open. Um, and, and, and basically that means that they either wanted to change the language, they either, nothing was a priority to them, the whole entire contract was pretty much up for negotiation. And which is not, I don't know if anyone, if people are familiar with how bargaining works, but that's not really um, the tradition. Usually an organization would come to a bargaining table and say, listen, I have five things in the contract that really bothers me um, and we really want to negotiate on this, right? So we tried to get it to the point where um, they would talk about what are, what's really important to you. That never worked. Um, they still insisted that everything was a priority. And for two years, we've been going back and forth. They tried to take away our health care. Um, one of the things they wanted to do is have language in our health care, particularly stating that they have the ability to change it whenever they want to. And we were like, well, especially since going to COVID and all of the, you know, all of the horrors that we saw about how, you know, administration could just go and not make nurses go without PPE and how dangerous that could be for us and our community. We were horrified of that idea. Um, we were being exposed to COVID. Um, we did not know the state and, and then we were trying to get tested. Even that was a challenge. So we definitely knew for a fact that our healthcare was important to us and that's not something we wanted to compromise. Um, and the idea of them being able to change it um, without even sitting down and discussing what kind of changes were going to be was not something that we were willing to even think about. Um, to this day, we're still having that same compensation. Uh, we insist that if you're going to make changes to our contract when it comes to our health care, we should have a say. We should come to the table. We should talk about it. Um, but they insist that, you know, we can talk about it, but ultimately, we get to do whatever we want. So again, that, that's a challenge for us. They want to take away um, important things like our professional nursing council. Um, that is a council of nurses that meet monthly. Um, we talk about things that are important to the hospital, things like workplace violence. We had a huge workplace violence issues um, that spiked within the past year. One of the reasons being that the Board of Supervisors made um, San Leandro Hospital um, a designated 5150 hospital, which means that a lot of the patients from our community with mental health issues were coming to us. Now, the problem with making us a 5150 center was they did not equip us or educate the nurses on how to deal with these patients. They just made us, they literally, it was a matter of what's on paper with no training. So we had 5150, um, I don't know if you, I'm sure you pay attention to the news, we had one of our patients actually escaped and killed someone in the community. Again, that had to do with a lot of the issues we were already facing in addition to this coming lack of training, um, not having enough staff, and the fact that it was just <laughs> we the same issues we keep warning administration about. We don't have enough staff to watch all of these patients. There were times where half of the rooms in the emergency room was just 5150 patients. Those patients, you know, they require constant observation or else they're just going to get up and walk out of the emergency room and you're going to need someone to chase them. And that was the problem we warned them about. <laughs> it happened exactly as we said it was going to happen. And before we knew it, again, it's not just our problem. Now it becomes a community problem. So <laughs> there were just, there's just been so many things. Um, of course, one of the biggest one was COVID, PPE. Um, like many of the nurses that crowd to our, 
been crying throughout the nation, just doing things that we know that was not scientifically right, like reusing our N95 masks, having the same mask that you have to use for a whole week. We all know that we've never done that before, ever. That's never been a part of nursing practice. You use the N95 once, you throw it away. That's always been our practice. But yet, CDC comes because the CDC says it's okay, despite the fact that we have scientific evidence saying that's not okay, we're going to do it anyways and put our patients at risk and put our, you know, nurses at risk. Um, having access to PPE, we're in an emergency room. Literally, emergencies are happening all around us. We're going to need gloves right away. We're going to need masks right away. But yet, the management chose to put our, our, our PPE all the way in the back office where the manager office is. So I have many incidences where a patient needs me right away or I need a mask, a glove, and I need to grab it right away. But guess what? We're out of, we're out of the little supplies that we have here. So somebody is literally running all the way back to the manager's office that's locked or have to find a manager while I'm in um, soil PPE or while I'm waiting to get the PPE that I need before I go into my patient's room. So again, delaying care, um, lack of staffing, uh, lack of resources that we needed to take care of our community. Um, I, you know, I, I just want people to understand that we dealt with this for two years. Um, our members were upset. They wanted to strike earlier. They felt like, you know, this is far overdue, but it just really got to the point where we couldn't wait any longer. This is, we're speaking with uh, Mawata Kamara, and she is a nurse at San Leandro Hospital, a uh, chief uh, representative of the CNA National Nurses Union. Now, the uh, Alameda Health Service, a AHS, has been uh, set up by the uh, Alameda Board of Supervisors are the Alameda Board of Supervisors aware of the fact that they're trying to bust the union and basically attacking your right to have proper health and safety and protect yourself and the patients? They are well aware. They are well aware. I've been to many meetings in their office. I'm very familiar with that whole building. Uh, we set up meetings with them individually. We went to their um, board of supervisors meeting. We've had nurses there giving testimonies about what's going, to the going on in the hospital. Um, we've been going back and forth there for the past two years, letting them know what's going on. And we keep getting the same response. We're, that's horrible. What's going on? Um, we're going to do something in our body. We're going to send them a message. At first, was the mess that's generally what they were saying in the beginning. And then at one point, we started going and we started hearing, you know, AHS is not even listening to us. They're, even, they're suing us, you know? So we just started to get the, you know, we started to get the general idea. There was no accountability. They were in charge of running the hospitals, but yet it was in the hand of the board of trustees who was not being regulated. So there was just no accountability, no accountability. We go to the board of supervisors, they tell us, oh, the board of trustees is a, a head, um, you know, in charge of that. And we're going to talk to them and we're going to have a meeting so we can fix things. Nothing got done two years we've been going to their office. I personally have <laughs> been going to a lot of the meetings and telling them what's going on at AHS. But you were kind of getting the runaround by yeah. the supervisors. Absolutely. And uh, in California, we have the uh, Cal OSHA, which is responsible for t protecting the health and safety of California workers, healthcare workers, frontline workers, such as yourselves. What has been your experience with Cal OSHA and their role in protecting your health and safety on the job? I honestly feel like many, everybody filled us during this pandemic. Um, Cal OSHA, CNA has made many attempts to um, condemn the changes that were made by the CDC. Um, you know, at first we felt like when they came out with the guidelines, um, they were strong and then as things changes whether it was you know politics or whatever the situation might have been they changed the guidelines um there you know nurses even us had questions you know on any normal day um jaco would have been all over safety concerns in the hospital they would be doing infections they would even you know 
things as simple as leaving water at the nursing station was an issue. So now all of these big organizations that were typically regu making regulations for um, hospital safety were not responding to us. Um, and that was just our general experience from local, local level to federal level, all of those checks and balances that were put in place to make sure nurses were getting adequate PPE, to make sure nurses were just the basic safety needs in the hospitals were being met. A lot of those institutions failed us. It yeah. took the union to fight back. And you say that you lost a large number of nurses when these changes were made. What impact did that have on healthcare at San Leandro Hospital and AHS? So a lot of the nurses that were full-time started to go into other places to look for jobs um, that felt that either could, you know, provide the benefits that they needed or um, just make, meet their needs better. Um, of course, this is going to have an impact on our staffing. Um, I've worked, been working for the past, the past two weeks that I've been working every day with short staff. Every day, it's, it's an emergency. Every day, um, you know, there was one shift I had two weeks ago where I was triaging patients in an emergency room, but because we were short a nurse in the pit, we have an issue, an area called the pit where patients that were, you know, have minor things like burns and things like that. You'll have a nurse there assessing them and they don't have to be admitted in an emergency room, but they would just go home. We didn't have a nurse there that day. So I'm triaging patients, I'm working as a pit nurse, and I'm also <laughs> checking in in a mini emergency room, you know, to see if we have beds there. Um, and then patients in the emergency, in, in the holding area are upset because a lot of them feel like, you know, we've been waiting here too long. What's going on? So you have to go out, you know, take time again and go and tell them, hey, we're short staff. And then it's always been, this has been our story for a very long time. We are just short staff. And we can't, we would love to help you faster, but we can't. And again, I'm always going to say, when people are short staff and nurses are being rushed to do things, mistakes, it, human mistakes are being made. And that's just not safe for our patients or for our nurses. And again, we're speaking with uh, Mawata Kamara. And do you think that the issue of race, uh, brown, black people, oppressed people, that that's the reason there's a lack of interest on the part of the uh, board of Supervisors to make sure that there's proper treatment and care for uh, your patients? Well, I, I can't necessarily speak to that, um, but I, I can say that I just think that AHS, the, the hospital within AHS, um, particularly San Leandro Hospital and um, Highland Hospital, the majority of the patients that go there are black and brown. Um, whether or not the Board of Supervisors intentionally or are neglecting those areas because of race, um, I don't know. I can't, you know, make a bold statement about that. But I do know that those patients suffer a great deal because of their negligence. They suffered a great deal. Um, you know, as an African-American, as an African, um, we were already vulnerable to COVID because a lot of us live in extended families. Um, I've had a lot of African-American fam, uh, um, young people who, you know, have contracted COVID from work. Um, one of my first patients, he was there. He was, he had all the classic symptoms of, of COVID and we're telling him to self-quarantine. And the only thing he was thinking about was the fact that he lives with his grandfather and he lives with his little brother. Who's going to take care of them? Who's going to take care of them? Those are the people that we needed to be reaching out to. Those are the people that we needed to be, um, we needed to start early with finding hotels to put them into self-quarantine, making sure that there were resources available to their families at home. So they don't have to worry about leaving the hotels and going, you know, trying to figure out how their family is going to survive when they're not around. Um, we failed them a great deal. We did. Um, and I just wish that, you know, that the Board of Supervisors would have acted earlier. I wish they would have acted more aggressively. And maybe we wouldn't be, we wouldn't be here if they did. And the issue of uh, testing, tracing, tracking, what is the situation for uh, patients that come in that do have COVID, are told to go home? Is there testing, uh, tracing, and tracking going on? And can even the uh, the staff there, yourself and other nurses, get tested properly. That was it. It was such a huge mess when that first started. 
at first we were supposed to call the state and then at one point um you know one thing with COVID in general the rules of engagement was changing on a daily basis um today we're doing one thing tomorrow we're not doing it that thing anymore we're starting something new and all of these changes were communicated to emails lots and lots of emails with multiple attachments that you are supposed to go home after your eight or 12 hour shift to go read and that was how we were communicated to so i feel like a lot of essential information was lost a lot of important processes that needed to be taught to nurses versus communicated to emails were lost and because of that a lot of things have to do with tracing i know i remember when we first started we had to call the state board and then it was it was simple as telling them what the patient's symptoms are and then the, the board will call us back and tell us whether or not the person needed to be tested and then the person um, didn't need to be tested at which point we would send them home and tell them to self-quarantine or if they were sick enough we left them in an emergency room that changed so rapidly so rapidly um today now we have rules that to me doesn't make sense um Something like if someone tested positive for COVID before and they went home and they tested negative, they go home, maybe they didn't have symptoms at the time. If that patient comes back and they're clearly having symptoms of COVID, we're not testing them anymore. Which doesn't make sense to me because we know people can get reinfected. So how does tracing for that works? I don't know. Um, and it's very, um, I, I remember having a patient that came back with COVID symptoms, who the last time they were tested, they were negative, but then they came back their COVID symptoms. And I'm taking care of this patient, um, and I'm asking, are we testing this patient for COVID? And they're like, well, no, according to the new regulations, we don't have to test them anymore. So then this also means that this patient is not even on isolation precautions. So I'm like, well, this is very dangerous because a nurse or a doctor or anybody from, um, you know, that goes into that patient room could very well be getting infected and taking it to another patient. Again, this is all things that we do that goes back to the community because we're, you know, the system is not organized. And the whole situation of public uh, health in the United States, it, it, it appears that, uh, that the virus, uh, the pandemic is continuing to grow, continuing to expand, um, and uh, we're coming into fall, uh, the flu season. Are you concerned that this pandemic can get completely out of control? Potentially millions of people could die from it. I'm very concerned. I am very concerned. I think about that every day. Um, I, <laughs> we're not ready. And it's sad because how many months, if it's been almost a year, and we're still saying we're not ready because, you know, there's, still people trying to decide if this is a myth and there's so people who you know just trying to decide whether they want to wear a mask or not and then there's a whole group of people who just feel like I'm done I want to be outside um I just I feel like we would have been in such a different place had we been aggressive from the beginning and letting people know this is a threat this is a virus. This virus can kill people. And we would have known, we knew this because we saw it happen in other countries, right? Um, I'm concerned. I don't know what's going to happen. I'm wishing for the best. Um, but, you know, it, any nurse in the emergency room just knows that whatever happens, you know, we're nurses, we're going to have to be there. So um, we're going to hope for the best, but we don't know what's going to happen. I am concerned. Um, African-American community, our older people um, in our communities. Um, I just hope that, you know, we can do a little bit more to help them this time around. And so your union, along with SEIU, ILW Local 6, are uh, voted, they're planning to go out or either support the picket line or be on the picket line. Um, what kind of support do you have in the union and among your, uh, your colleagues and also the, the community? We are very much ready and feel like this is far overdue. That is both unions. Um, nurses at San Leandro Hospital voted 99% yes for the strike. Nurses at Alameda Health voted 100%. Um, and I believe SEIU or Highland voted 98%. We are all ready to get on that picket line. 
we feel like we've been taken advantage of. We feel like we haven't been listened to. We are tired physically and emotionally, and we just want to let them know that it's not okay, and it was never okay. All we wanted was a fair contract. We wanted a contract that would help us do our job and put our best foot forward for our community and for ourselves. And unfortunately, this is where we are. And your union, I think, and other unions have called for the transfer of uh, the operational control away from AHS to uh, Alameda County. Uh, why do they refuse to, to take that action of uh, uh, getting rid of AHS since apparently from your report and other reports, uh, they're basically not properly taking care of healthcare, the workers and the patients? Well, um, I'm, what we asked the Board of Supervisors to do is to take AHS control from the Board of Trustees and we, before they were the one who were um, in control of that. Um, now, we've gotten many answers, mostly the most recent one was, you know, not in the middle of a pandemic. We just feel like there's more pressing things to, you know, take care of. And I mean, we just felt like it was so far overdue. We feel like, especially during a pandemic, but so you really need to do something. And then, but from what's been going on in the past, you know, few weeks, it's just really demonstrated um, our theory that the Board of Supervisors really doesn't have any control over AHS. Um, they could have done something a long time ago to stop them. They could have done it. But now it seems like now we're, we're, you know, we call for a strike. Everybody's really trying to, you know, put an end to the situation and um, want to, you know, make sure there's no, not a strike going on because this is going to happen and it's doing a pandemic. And, you know, again, I'm going to, I'm going to repeat myself. We started this because we wanted a fair contract. We fought, fought it because we want to be respected as a union. Um, that is what we still want. And if the Board of Supervisors wanted to demonstrate that they are in fact in control, this is their perfect moment to do so and put an end to this. And what can people do who want to support you, people in the community? and other uh, working people and people who want to protect public health and make sure that the system works for the people who need it. We are going to be on the picket line from the 7th to the 12th. Um, if community members, so we're taking precautions, we do realize that in the middle of pandemic and we are gonna be taking um, you know, precaution and social distancing, but we also have a lot of you know, community organizations that are like DSA that's gonna be joining us um, to make this event successful. So please, if you have questions, come out and answer your questions, wear your mask, of course. Um, there are, you know, online um, efforts. You can go to CNA um, website to find out more information. I'm pretty sure SEIU has stuff on their website as well, how you can get involved. Uh, we want to let the community know that we're not just doing this because, you know, we want to do it for us. This is a fight for the nurses and our communities because as I always say, nurses live in the same communities that you are in. And if we're sick, we're going to bring those sicknesses back to you. So it's very important for people to understand that this is a fight for all of us. So if you want to get involved, get in contact with CNA. Um, we are going to be on a picket line. If you have questions, we will answer your questions. We will be more than happy with questions. And please call AHS and let them know that they're not, we're, you are not okay with the way they're treating their nurses and you are not okay with the way they're treating their community health care right. and the board of supervisors. <laughs> <laughs> Let them know too. Okay, well, I want to thank you very much for joining us. We've been talking with Mwata Kamara. She's a nurse, chief nurse at San Leandro Hospital and with the CNA. So thanks for joining us on Workweek, Kamara. Thank you very much for your time.